Have you ever not wanted to have sex? But then you have the thought, shit, I don't want to say no. What kind of man would I be if I turned down sex? Or maybe you're dating someone that wants to have sex more than you and you find yourself thinking, there must be something wrong with me. I'm supposed to want sex all of the time. What's going on? And then you're wondering, is it my testosterone levels? Should I start taking Viagra? Is there really something wrong with me? Well, in this episode, we are going to break down what has led to these moments, why you have these thoughts, and really what you can do about it. In order to walk through all of this, we are joined by Cam Fraser, a world-renowned sexologist from Australia. He is here to walk through what is leading all of this to happen. He's here to talk about testosterone, replacement therapy, even things like premature ejaculation and erectile dysfunction, and yes, how to really actually expand your sexual satisfaction at the end of the day, whether you're having sex all the time or on occasion. This episode is so potent. You guys, let's get some. Cam Fraser, welcome to The Naked Connection. So excited to have you here today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to jump in. Yeah, yeah, I really want to dive right in with you. And I am so curious to kick things off. If you were to summarize what you've been doing in the last, say, decade with men, what would you say? I would say that I help men overcome anxiety, shame, and restrictive stories about masculinity and sexuality to embrace pleasure-oriented, full-bodied experiences of sex. Mm. Yeah, I'd leave it at that, I think. I think that's a great start. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, and... And in thinking about um, some of these stereotypes of male sexuality, what have you seen so far as kind of the predominant stereotypes that are placed on men in this in this space? Yeah, so I kind of alluded to like restrictive beliefs and, and those are, are essentially stereotypes or what I affectionately call myths, man myths. And some of the major ones that come to my mind and I, I want to, you know, do, um, I want to credit the people who, who I am informed by. So there's a really good book actually that I'd like to plug called Not Always in the Mood by a Canadian sex re- researcher and sex therapist, Sarah Hunter Murray. And uh, her book goes into a lot of like the research behind where some of these myths mm-hmm. come from. And so that's one of the books I'd like to credit. Um, and there's another one called uh, The New Male Sexuality by Bernie Zilbergeld as well, which is really fantastic for people that want to, you know, nerd out like myself. Um, But some of the major ones are that male libido or male sex drive is high, unyielding, unwavering. You know, men want sex all the time. Men think about sex every seven seconds. You know, it's just like purely physical. It's like, you know, men just only want one thing. You've probably seen it in, in like article headlines and stuff that's you know targeted towards women about like how to understand their male partners better it's like guys, you know, guys are simple ladies men are simple they just want to have sex like it's a very it's a yeah. very common trope in media as well i kind of think of joey tribbiani from friends right mm-hmm. like he's personifies this high unyielding unwavering sex drive you know only thinks about sex kind of one track mind and and you know, there are men, there are people, I wouldn't even say men, there are people who do have higher libidos, who have high sex drives, who do want to have more frequent and more elaborate and more intense sexual experiences, right? That, I'm not denying that. But when there is the stereotype that it is all men that have unyielding, unwavering sex drives, and usually that's that the, the second half of that kind of stereotype is that, and all women don't, right? And all women have lower sex drives or, you know, less... Uh, they want less frequent sex, right? And that plays out into a uh, kind of dynamic where men are the aggressors or pursuers or initiators and women are the gatekeepers, the ones that are kind of reticent and passive and reluctant. And that strips women of agency, right? If we kind of, you know, uh, move, uh, if we extend and expand our logic from that stereotype, it strips women of agency and it kind of puts them, puts the onus on women to kind of be the, the gatekeepers of sex and it's their responsibility to either consent or not consent, Uh, And, you know, it it kind of like dismisses men's agency within like that, where it comes to like asking for consent and and seeking it out in a kind of positive, enthusiastic way. 
so there's a lot of ripple effects that come from this like one stereotype that men just want to have sex all the time. Um, and usually what I see is that that is conflated with testosterone. Like usually the way that that whole high sex drive is talked about is hormonal, right? It's like biological, it's natural, it's hormonal that men want sex all the time and that they have a high sex drive all the time and it doesn't fluctuate at all. Um, and the, the culprit there is, is usually testosterone. And so I, I see like testosterone zealots online, you know, like men's coaches and, and, you know, male health optimization experts kind of tout testosterone as this be all and end all of male health. Uh, and, and you'll see it in like a lot of the marketing for testosterone supplements and things like that. They're like, you know, the, the language is always like alluding to like, oh, boost your sex drive, like boost your, boost your libido, things like that. But testosterone and sex drive, it isn't a one-to-one -one relationship. Sure. There's a correlation there between higher levels of testosterone and more desire and interest in sex. And, and there's is even some evidence to suggest that it's eat like Sometimes men feel it's a little bit easier to be aroused as well. If they've got high levels of testosterone, that comes from research from guys that are on testosterone replacement therapy, for example. Uh, however, like I said, it's not one-to-one -one because there's also research that suggests that testosterone replacement therapy doesn't impact men across the board in terms of increasing the libido. There's a, there's a, a, a good percentage of guys who don't experience higher libido or higher sex drive purely from just taking more testosterone or just having more testosterone in their system. And that's because sex drive, sexual behavior, our experience of pleasure is impacted by so many other things, so many other like neurochemicals in our body, neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin and prolactin, for example, um, estrogen and estradiol, uh, cortisol. And there's so many other things that factor into the way that we experience our desire for sex that just increasing testosterone doesn't always, it's not always the case that that'll, that'll increase your sex drive. In fact, there's some interesting research that found that men who were taking estradiol supplementation and no testosterone supplementation experienced higher levels of libido and sex drive as well. All right. And that's, that goes counter to this idea that it's just testosterone that, that results in higher, higher sex drive. And, you know, so I, I could, I could harp on all day, but the, even if we do take, <laughs> even if we do take, right. So this is, this is interesting. Even if we do take that stereotype at face value and that it's testosterone, which is responsible for sex drive, testosterone fluctuates, right? We know that testosterone, it's very well documented that it's high in the morning and low in the evening, right? It's called a diurnal variation of testosterone. That's, that's very well documented. Uh, we also know that testosterone fluctuates um, over the lifespan as well. It, it gradually declines. In, in fact, there's a little bit of controversy around that because there's some evidence that suggests that if you're a healthy uh, man as you age, like your diet and you're not smoking and you're, you're um, not drinking and things like that, that there's actually not so much fluctuation in testosterone, but that's, um, that's very new research. And, and you know, it's, I would hazard a guess and say unrealistic research as well, because you know, the vast majority of people either drink or don't eat healthily throughout their whole lifetime. So I don't know how realistic it is, but, um, but there's that, you know, documented fluctuation as well as the steady decline. Uh, there's also some evidence to suggest that testosterone fluctuates on a seasonal basis as well. It, the, the research is a little bit conflicting, but some of the research suggests that it's testosterone is higher in the cooler months in winter and lower in the summer months. Um, again, there's only like three studies looking at seasonal variations in testosterone. So it's not super conclusive, but there is evidence to suggest that there's a kind of yearly seasonal variation or fluctuation. There's also some evidence which suggests that, uh, there are circadian rhythms that, you know, go through 20 and 30 day cycles. So, um, again, that's not conclusive, but there's some like, you know, uh, some small evidence to suggest that there are those those circadian rhythms in in testosterone fluctuation as well and people that are taking testosterone replacement therapy like the way that that has evolved is that they try and mimic the natural variations and fluctuations in testosterone right it isn't just you taking testosterone to peak yourself out all the time when you're when you're prescribed testosterone it's to try and you know mimic those natural variations and fluctuations because there's the implicit acknowledgement that it does fluctuate so even if we are saying that testosterone equals sex drive, which it surely doesn't, there's still variations in testosterone that you've got to <laughs> yeah. consider. So, um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm a big advocate for like trying to unpack that particular stereotype because I see it played out all the time. I see a lot of guys that come to me and they say, Hey, my wife 
wants more sex than I do, mm -hmm. I'm broken. Something is wrong with me as a man because my wife has a higher sex drive than I do. But the research tells us from, and these are from, this is from data of uh, you know, surveys that are done of couples that are seeing relationship therapists and sex therapists, is that 50% of all couples that see sex therapists are going there for a libido discrepancy issue, mm -hmm. right? So that's you know very common that one person in the relationship has a higher sex drive than the other or desires sex more than the other. 50% of those couples, it's the woman who has higher sex drive than mm -hmm. the male partner, right? So if we're going off just the data of people that are seeing sex therapists for some sort of issue in their relationship, it's 50-50, right? And, um, and I think that's really important to acknowledge is because a lot of guys, like I said, internalize that stereotype and they think that something is wrong with them if they don't desire to have sex all the time. And again, I was kind of talking about like extending our logic from that. One of the one of the extrapolations of that particular stereotype is that guys will always say yes to sex. Right? Yeah. And I, I, I ask men when I work with them, have you ever said no to sex? When was the last time you said no to sex? And and the vast majority of guys will say to me, well, I've never done that. I've always, like, I, it just, you know, I, and, and, you know, when, when I kind of scratch at the surface, we uncover like, or maybe there's an expectation that I should always say yes to sex. Maybe I should, like, that's just what men, men do, right? Men, men want sex. And so we'll, and it's in our language as well, like, God, oh, getting lucky, right? So like a lot of guys will, will think, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky to have sex. So I'll, 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 I'll take, you know, any holes a goal, right? Like that's kind of like the, the mentality. I mean, <laughs> and I, I, I'll, I won't project there. Like I had that mentality as a younger man, right? It's like, I will always say yes to sex because, you know, sex, sex, right? Wherever it's, you know, good sex or bad sex, I'll, I'll say, yes, that was something that I, I held as a belief system about my sexuality and masculinity. Um, and so a lot of guys, when we start to like really unpack that idea, um, they expressed to me, you know, that if they were to say no to sex, that they might be letting their partner down, right? Or their partner might, or it doesn't have to be a partner, but the, the and I work with heterosexual guys. So it's like, then the woman might think that they're gay, right? Like that was a fear that I had was if I said, if I said no to sex, in fact, I, I had young women when I, you know, on the rare occasion that I did say no to sex, say, what are you gay? You know, like there was this wow. un, underlying internalized homophobia that was informing my decision to say yes to sex uh, not all the time right but there were there was occasions right where i was where there was some fear and some anxiety that if i said no it would mean something about my sexuality right that i would be less of a man because mm -hmm. i turned down sex um so yeah so that like root stereotype that like men's sex drive is high and unyielding and unwavering when we start to extrapolate from that it kind of leads out and ripples out into some other other beliefs that we have about men and sex and um and masculinity yeah. in general. So I've, I've said a lot there, but uh, hopefully there were some threads we could pull. <laughs> Apologize oh my for gosh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, as you've been sharing this, it really has pinpointed how this one really kind of foundational myth can have such a large impact, not only on people's sex lives, but on their relationships, on how they perceive themselves, their status in the world, like how they relate to women and how women relate to them. I know and a handful of times like under having conversations with women where they're like oh yeah he turned me down like what and then we internalize that to mean all of these other things about us that's then rooted from this expectation that men are supposed to always want to have sex so it's a pretty massive component of how we all experience intimacy so I appreciate totally. you opening and that up yeah yeah you hit the nail on the head like a, a lot of self-worth stories can come up for female yeah. partners for guys when they you know of guys when they turn down sex like oh am i not does he not find me attractive mm -hmm. am i not hot enough is he not interested in me anymore you know which mm -hmm. that 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 dynamic in reverse is very rarely true mm -hmm. right like we, we really like if a woman turns down a guy for sex we really go oh she doesn't find me attractive like she's i'm not she's not i'm not hot anymore like that that kind of you know uh, dynamic uh, rarely plays out in the opposite direction, mm -hmm. but um, but yeah, when a guy turns down sex, there's something wrong, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the the underlying or the undertone of of that decision, um, yeah. and you know it, it, again extrapolating it leads into some pretty um, like I don't want to say more serious necessarily, but like some more grave like ideas about masculinity. One of which is like, mm -hmm. well, if men always want sex and like they're always down to fuck right like mm -hmm. that's kind of like the stereotype then you know one of the extrapolations is well men can't be sexually abused right men can't be sexually assaulted because mm -hmm. right? they they always want to have sex right so if that's our belief system about men then you know men can't be um 
you know, can't experience sexual assault. And, you know, this ties into another stereotype that I really want to highlight here, which is yeah. not, not necessarily a stereotype, but it's more of a belief about the male body, which is that if a guy has an erection, it means he's turned on. Mm-hmm. Right? And if, it, yeah. if he doesn't have an erection, it means he's not turned on, right? With this, this, there's this conflation of the two. But there's a difference between subjective mental psychological arousal and feeling turned on and desiring to have sex and wanting to have sex and physiological arousal, which is engorgement and erection mm-hmm. and even ejaculation, right, to an extent as well. And the same thing is true for, for women, right? If you mm-hmm. There's a difference between being psychologically turned on, desiring to have sex, wanting to have sex and, and being engorged and lubricated, yeah. right? It's like yeah. one of the reasons why there's people talking about the importance of foreplay. Right, because it's like, all right, we've got to you know take some time to to allow the body to build that that sensitivity and that that sexual arousal. Um, mm-hmm. But because there's this like belief that okay, if a guy has an erection, it means he's turned on, and if he doesn't have an erection, it means he's not. Then when guys and and a lot of guys experience this, which is like the non-concordance that happens, right? So yeah, a very very simple, uh, and this is called arousal non-concordance for those that are interested. It's a very simple example of this is like. Uh, I share this and I get guys go, yeah, that's happened to me. So this is almost like a, a universal that I've, I've heard from guys. It's like them wanting to have sex, them being with their partner, maybe, or even like with a, a new partner, um, you know, casually, whatever. And they're like in the moment, in the mood, they're like ready to have sex. They're desiring, they're consenting, they're, they're turned on, but they don't have an erection. Right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're, their cock hasn't got hard yet. And um, oftentimes because we, we think so like penis- centered when it comes to sex like whether sex for a lot of couples only happens if there's a, a an erect penis involved right so like broadening your definition of sex is really helpful mm-hmm. here but um but like a, a lot of guys will, will go oh fuck well I'm, I'm really turned on but my cock's not working right is the the belief there and a lot of partners will see that like oh he's he's here with me but his, his penis isn't hard does that mean he doesn't want to be here does that mean i'm not attractive does that mean he's not turned on Mm-hmm. Right again, because there's the conflation of of physical and subjective arousal. Um, so that's like one yeah. scenario that a lot of people can can tend to relate to. And the the solution to that scenario, if there's nothing like underlyingly medically, there's no medical condition like diabetes or something that mm-hmm. is contributing to that. Then very often the solution to that is giving yourself more time to allow the body and the mind to sync up. Just like yeah. being in the moment a bit more, focusing on pleasure that doesn't involve an erect penis. Right, just getting the momentum going being relaxed right enjoying the experience oftentimes when that particular situation happens guys get up into the head like oh my god my dick's not working oh fuck like i'm not going to be able to like penetrate oh my god and it becomes this stressful anxious experience which you know makes them constrict and contract in their body Uh, and if you know anything about erections they're a function of the parasympathetic nervous system so like Mm -hmm. if you're anxious and stressed and worrying about performance and not having an erection Mm -hmm. that's going to shoot you in the foot because you're in your sympathetic branch of your nervous system where you're anxious and stressed out uh, and so you're not giving yourself any opportunity to be in that parasympathetic branch and allow that engorgement and erection to happen so very simple solution is just relax as much as you can focus on pleasure keep the ball rolling give Mm -hmm. yourself that time to Mm -hmm. to uh, be in pleasure with your partner the other end of the spectrum though is a little bit more um again like serious is the word that comes to mind but maybe it's a bit more um you know grave is, is also the word but it's guys that don't want to have sex they don't consent to sex and they're not mentally aroused right they don't, they're not mm-hmm. they don't want to be there and they're being sexually assaulted mm-hmm. and their body responds by getting an erection this research that suggests about 50 to 60 percent of guys who are the victims of sexual assault get an erection and the research also suggests that about 20 percent of guys that experience sexual assault um, or are the victims of it will also ejaculate as well and Mm -hmm. that's you know they're not consenting to it they don't want it it's not enjoyable but their body has a physiological response to the stimulation that they're receiving and that can be really confusing for a lot of guys, right? Yeah. The, the guys that have experienced that. It's confusing for people maybe hearing it as well. Like, well, but get, me getting an erection means he's turned on. Well, it, it, that's not that's not the case, right? That's the mm-hmm. whole point of this disentangling of that belief system. Um, and a lot of guys express feelings of betrayal of their body. Right? They feel like their body betrayed them. They feel really confused and, and they start to question, did I really actually enjoy that? Did I really yeah. actually want that to happen? You know, and they, they can start to feel um yeah quite uh, quite confused and conflicted about that that experience um and so and again that leads to that 
that myth, let's say, that men can't be sexually assaulted, right? Well, if you got an erection, it must mean you secretly enjoyed it, you know, and um, getting into that kind of uh, victim blaming um, mentality there. So you know, there's the kind of two ends of that spectrum of that arousal non-concordance where there's a yeah. difference between physical and, and subjective arousal. And, and I think it's important to to kind of voice that as, as a sex educator, right? Yeah. That's something that I need to be <laughs> telling you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate you giving those two examples on the both sides of the spectrum. Um, yeah. The, the reality that arousal or that, yeah, arousal isn't necessarily desire and it also isn't necessarily consent mm-hmm. for anybody. Right. So recognizing that those are not entangled into the same thing that they're definitely separate i actually was reading um i've been slowly reading this book a billion wicked thoughts it's these two neuroscientists who are studying um basically looking at pornography searches and they actually this morning i was reading it and they were talking about a study where they were looking at um and this one was particular for women's brains about how um they had these women watch, this is so bizarre. They had them watch a, t- a video of um, someone being having an amputation. And then they had them watch um, an erotic film. And then they observed their arousal. And they actually, and then they had another set where they watched a basic film, nothing, no, no amputation, nothing concerning. And then a watch an erotic film. And they actually noticed that there was more physiological arousal and the women who watched the amputation than the ones who did it. Um, but they reported less psychological arousal. So there's, it's so very separate. Um, and so I think important for everyone to recognize that for yourself and also for your partner too, and, and how to navigate that. Um, and you brought up on the, on the other side of that, what you already mentioned in the very beginning of this, that this I admit that men are simple and I'll never forget. I, this is probably a couple of years ago. I was listening to a podcast episode. Um, a woman was talking about how it was like a show for women. And she was talking about how simple men are that you can just turn them on and off like a light switch. And I was so bothered by it because I thought how, how unfair, how, you know, limiting to make that assumption. And, and I am so curious, you know, I can only have a woman's perspective, but that that must feel really limiting for a man to be hearing those things about what is actually possible for him. And also for us to understand as in a heterosexual relationship that our male partners are so much more complex than we probably are giving them credit for. And, and that can, I think, be viewed as a really beautiful way. And I know that you do a lot of work to expand what's possible for men sexually. And so looking at ways to do that and understanding that you aren't simple and that that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I often hear that like, you know, our oh, men are visual creatures, you know, mm-hmm. they just get turned on by the sight of you know, pornography or a woman or you know, whatever the, the visual cue is, um, you know, and the, and the research doesn't really back that up either. You know, there's a lot of variability in sexual arousal and desire, as you um, rightly pointed out with uh, uh, one of those pieces of research before. And, and I think, it really does a disservice not only to well, it does it does a disservice to the women that are hearing these messages about men and their male partners mm-hmm. and it does a disservice to the men themselves because it places you know it doesn't necessarily place limitations but it narrows rather than broadens the mm-hmm. way that a lot of people will approach sex yeah. and pleasure right with with men in their life you know and um and i, I I, I get a lot of guys who adhere to these beliefs, right? They've been told them, they have. it's been reinforced by their mates, it's been reinforced by the media. I, I spoke about Joey Tribbiani before and there's, mm-hmm. you know, one of the things that I, I like to do is, you know, kind of speak about uh, media literacy, right? And so here's a, an invitation to the people that are listening is like, watch how male sexuality is presented in your favorite TV shows and movies. And oftentimes you'll see that like, for a lot of the, these male characters, like getting aroused and turned on is like really easy. And it's like, you know, very straightforward and very simple, very linear as well. Sex is oftentimes very, very linear. It's like get an erection, penetrate, ejaculate, and then roll over and go to sleep, right? The, the Hollywood trope of having a cigarette and go to bed. Um, <laughs> and that, you know, and and that, that, that kind of story of male sexuality is also perpetuated by um, a, a bit of academic... Um, 
like the academic research around male sexual response, for example, which is which starts in the 1960s with Masters and Johnson, has a very linear, simple, narrow way of defining male sexual response, right? Which is um, arousal, erection, orgasm, and resolution, right? It's called the four phase model, the Masters and Johnson's model of male sexual response. And it kind of, you, you, most people have already seen it on a graph if they've seen like any sexual response models, kind of goes up, plateaus, spikes, and then drops off rapidly. And that is sure, one way of experiencing sexual arousal and having a sexual response cycle. But there's so much more variability and there's research that's come out in the last like couple of years, which has really started to challenge that model of male sexual mm-hmm. response because it hasn't been challenged for many, like decades. And yeah. you know, the, the female model of sexual response has been revised, revisited and critiqued about nine times. Um, and, you know, for, for good measure, right? Because it's, it's, meant, you know, it's meant to be critiqued. But I don't know whether it's like academia informing you know, lay people's opinions in the media, or if it's media kind of perpetuating these ideas, you know, that academic researchers just go, well, we don't need to, we don't need to study male sexuality because it's easy, simple, right? Guys just get it up and get off. And that's, that's it. You know? And, um, and so it's really cool that in the last like two or three years, there's been some studies that have really started to pick apart that model, because for example, it doesn't, it doesn't talk about non-ejaculatory orgasms. Right, mm-hmm. the resolution period only happens after an ejaculation, mm-hmm. so or the it's called the refractory period. So, if a guy has a orgasm that doesn't involve an ejaculation, then there's no refractory periods. So that model doesn't match that response, right? Or if he has a prostate orgasm, that doesn't match that response either. That doesn't take into consideration desire and emotions. It's very physiologically based, right? So, there's a lot of um, variables that aren't taking into that like very simple linear model of male sexual response, but that is very much played out in a lot of the media that we watch. Uh, and and the on the flip side as well, any male sexual dysfunction in media, like not, I would say 95% of the time is the butt of a joke, right? Mm-hmm. Struggling to get an erection, play the laugh track, you know, it's played mm-hmm. for comedic effect. Uh, coming too quickly, again, it's a big mm-hmm. joke amongst the, the movie. Um, you know, uh, has low libido, I will code him as effeminate or weak or gay, right? Like if he doesn't want to have sex all the time, there's something wrong with him. And again, it's a, it's a punchline of a joke. So like a lot of the beliefs that guys have about like them being broken or that like it's shameful or or that it's something to be concerned about that they have, you know, a, a different experience than this very simple linear expression of like male sexuality it, it, like it's because the reason why I have a job, you know, is because a lot of these guys internalize those belief systems and go, mm-hmm. some, I'm broken, something's wrong with me. And the way that like, I mean, I don't, I don't want to like throw the baby out with the bathwater necessarily, but the way that Western medicine has approached male sex, sexual dysfunction is, um, you know, treating men's bodies as machines, right? It's even in the, in the language dysfunction that reminds me of like malfunctioning machines, <laughs> right? And so yeah. it's very much like, here's a pill to fix that right? You, you're struggling to get an erection. Don't worry about all the psychological, emotional, subjective experiences. Just take this pill that'll get your blood flow going and you'll be able to get an erection again, right? Um, Viagra or Cialis or other, you know, vasodilators, or, you know, you're, you're coming quite quickly. Now we're prescribing low dose SSRIs, which are antidepressants mm-hmm. for that, right? It's like, don't worry about all the psychological, emotional, yeah. human experiences <laughs> of coming quite quickly. Yeah. Just take this pill, this SSRI to, to, what it is is it numbs you out that's why ssris are prescribed because they dull your sensations Mm -hmm. they dull your sensitivity which make you last longer so it's like flattening men to just just biology right just physiology rather than taking this holistic humanistic approach to who men are as individuals and what it is that turns them on and helping them relax and things like that so like i said there's there's value in it i suppose and i'm not against pharmaceuticals and medication i've got a lot of guys that i work with who do take Viagra and who do maybe take SSRIs for, um, you know, maybe for mental health reasons. So I'm, I'm not against it, but I think we have over pathologized variations in male mm-hmm. sexual response, like any slight variation from that very normal or normative, I should say, you know, linear sexual response is considered, you know, pathological. There's something wrong with it. We need to treat it. And I think there's an over medicalization as well. So the treatment becomes you know, medical. It's, it's pharmaceutical interventions. It's taken a pill. It's, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's not, there's no holistic approach, at least in, in my opinion, anyway, that's my yeah. rant again. Sorry. <laughs> no, yeah. Well, and it's, 
Um, from the research that I've done, statistically speaking, I mean, I think it was something like almost in America anyway, like 20% of men will ha- experience premature ejaculation at some point in their life and erectile dysfunction, you know, grows as you get older, but like up to, I think it was like 40% of men at like by age of 40 or 50 will have experienced erectile. So it's not like these are like uncommon things that are happening to people. And, and I know sometimes self-diagnosis can be a little funky, but like, even if those are moderately accurate statistics, like that's a the vast majority of men almost are having this one of these experiences at some point in their life. And so probably not really talking about it with anybody from your experience in the work that you've done. What are some of the ways that men can start if they have had a, an experience with ED or early ejaculation to remediate that without maybe perhaps like going straight away to using pharmaceutical drugs? Right. And I think you're touching on something here that I, I'd like to expand on very briefly, which is that, you know, a lot of guys do self-diagnose, right? Mm-hmm. They'll, they'll, and, you know, part of, part of it is because we don't have a lot of the language to describe our experiences, right? Mm-hmm. So a guy who maybe has some erection reliability concerns because we don't have the language to describe our sexual experiences now has erectile dysfunction, right? Mm-hmm. Struggles to get an erection a couple of times. Oh, fuck, I've got ED right? Yeah. Another guy who maybe comes a little bit quicker than he wants to, or his partner wants to, right? Because it, usually it's when there's another person involved. You wouldn't, mm-hmm. a lot of guys don't say, oh, I've got premature ejaculation and they're virgins, right? It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's yeah, yeah. because there's another person involved. Um, but again, because there's not a lot of language to describe their sexual experiences, because a lot of guys don't talk really wholeheartedly and genuinely and passionately about their sexual experiences with people in general, let alone other mm-hmm. men. It's immediately, oh, the language is I've got premature ejaculation, right? Mm -hmm. Or a lot of guys struggle with their relationship with pornography, right? Oh, I've got porn addiction, you know, like it's the, Mm -hmm. and those are clinical terms, right? Addiction, uh, uh, premature ejaculation, erectile dysfunction, they have porn addiction questionable, but like they're Mm -hmm. a diagnostic criterion that you have to meet in order to be diagnosed with those, They're, they're clinical diagnoses, right? But that's our, that's how lay people, that's how people just, you know, in general, will describe their sexual experiences with these clinical terms. And what I think is is helpful systemically or generally is like giving people more language to describe their sexual experiences. So one of the things that I really like to, to do around like erectile dysfunction, right, mm-hmm. um, is borrow a phrase from uh, another sex therapist by the name of Chris Donahue, who talks about erectile disappointment, right? Mm-hmm. Which is, um, you know, I'm not dysfunctional, I'm not broken. Um, just have these expectations about what my cock should and shouldn't do. And, uh, you know, it's not living up to those potentially unrealistic expectations. Yeah. Right? And, and we can blame, we, I mean, we can blame, we can play the blame game, but like one of the things that often gets blamed is pornography, right? And, and so I often ask guys, if they watch porn, when was the last time they saw a flaccid penis in pornography? I mean, you don't, you don't see flaccid cocks. Probably porn, never. Right? Especially in main, <laughs> yeah, not in mainstream porn at least, um, right? They, they just kind of like bounce out of, of mm-hmm. underpants and trousers, right? And it's, um, and so this, this leads to a lot of guys mm. kind of expecting that they should have an erection immediately. Right. And they don't know about arousal and concordance, you know, so they get up in their head if they don't have an erection immediately. And now because of the language or the, the limitation of the language, now I've got erectile dysfunction. Right. And so now I've got erectile dysfunction. What do I do? Because there's been such a advertising slash propaganda campaign by Pfizer and other pharmaceutical com- mm-hmm. companies. Oh, just go get the little blue pill, right? Oh, just go get the medication. And uh, again, I, I'm painting like a bleak picture here, but yeah. that that has played out for a lot of my clients. And then they'll come and see me and be like, "Um, doesn't work all the time. I'm taking Viagra. It doesn't work all the time. And you know, what's going on? What's wrong? And what that tells me immediately is it's because there's nothing physiologically wrong. Yeah. Right. It's because okay. you're you're um, treating, let's say, and I don't like the word treating there, but you're trying to navigate like a. Uh, emotional subjective psychological experience of arousal and desire and sex and expectation and narratives around masculinity by you know dilating your blood vessels mm-hmm. you know, it's like mm-hmm. <laughs> of course that's not going to work right like it's yeah. not a, it's not a problem of hydraulics mate it's a problem of <laughs> like your expectations and experiences of sexuality and pleasure and so um 
again, like this reduction of men down to, to the bio, biology is um, something I see a lot. I was mentioning before, right? Just take testosterone. You'll be good to go. You know, like that's very often used as rhetoric in like a lot of men's health spaces. It's like, oh, testosterone just solve all your problems. Again, that that's a re- reduction of men down to their biology, down to their their hormones, right? When when we're much more than that uh, as human mm-hmm. beings and as men. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm sorry, I went on a bit of a tangent there. No, and I yeah. can't forget, I, I forget what the original question was. <laughs> Uh, well, you were you were answering it, but uh, about how some ways that if a man has experienced, as I like how you so eloquently um, erectile disappointment, which I love so much. Like if if someone's had that experience, or if someone's experienced early ejaculation or premature ejaculation, like what are some things that they can start doing? And um, so you were starting down the path of how. A, reframing some of this language is really supportive. And I just want to say, as you were saying that, I'm like, I've never heard a woman say, you know, I have pussy dysfunction. Like no one's using that terminology. (laughs) So it's weird that we can use, flip it around. Um, But yeah, so I guess, is there anything in terms of, I know premature ejaculation or early ejaculation as well for that? Yeah. I mean, what I have a gripe against is people online saying, hey, do this one thing, it'll solve all your premature ejaculation <laughs> yeah. issues, right? Or it'll solve all your erection issues. Um, because there's different types of mm-hmm. premature ejaculation and erectile dysfunction, right? And it, that's even if it is actual premature ejaculation, which again, I could go on a huge tangent about like yeah. the way that that's studied and researched yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and population prevalence. But um, like, is it is it um, psychological, right? Is it due to anxiety? Is it due to nervous system issues? And this goes for both PE and ED, right? Is it neurological? Is it psychological or psychogenic? Is it um, physiological? Is it iatrogenic, right? Is it medication? Uh, is it a result of medication? Is it vasculogenic? Is it a result of blood flow issues? So um, that's like one thing to take into consideration when people that are listening to this go, oh, I'll try this thing for my, you know, I'm coming too quickly. I'll try this thing to help with me not coming so quickly is you know, is that approach aligning with the underlying causes of your premature ejaculation in the mm-hmm. first place, right? So it mm-hmm. isn't always like, oh, I'll try this. And what I said before, like a lot of guys who I work with, Viagra doesn't work for them, right? And it's because they're not, it's not a function of mm-hmm. uh, vasodilation and, and um, nitric oxide. Sure, it'll help, but the underlying root cause of their erection reliability issues is that they're anxious and stressed and they are placing expectation on themselves and what their penis should do. And like that makes them tense and tight and constricted and contracted and not experiencing pleasure and not being present with their partner because they're up in their head. And that's what's resulting in their inability to go into their parasympathetic nervous system and relax and mm-hmm. focus on the sensations of pleasure, which lead to engorgement, which lead to erection, which lead to penetration and all the other things that they want to do. So, mm-hmm. um, so my, my selection bias with the guys that I work with, because I'm not a medical practitioner, is I get a lot of guys who have psychogenic issues, mm-hmm. right? So what that means is like it's, it's a function of their performance anxiety. And mm-hmm. my, this is pure conjecture here, but like my observation is that, maybe it's not an observation, it's more of a belief, is that the vast majority of like men's sexual issues, whether it's coming too quickly or you know unreliable erections, is psychogenic. Now I've spoken to urologists and they seem to think that it's vasculogenic or, you know, it's, it's got something to do with the nervous system. Uh, and, I, and again, maybe it's just because of our, our differing professions uh, and, and selection bias, I would hazard a guess as well. <laughs> um, but, but I, I, I personally think that a lot of guys have like performance anxiety and that performance anxiety is manifesting as erection or ejaculation issues, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they're kind of two sides of the same coin, um, premature ejaculation and erectile dysfunction. And that coin is anxiety, is performance anxiety. And so mm-hmm. something that helps a lot with the men that I specifically work with is changing their narratives around sex, right? And the narratives around their own body. And part of that is having to do a bit of education for their partners as well. So rather than putting this pressure on to get an er- erection immediately and having to like have sex last a particular duration, mm-hmm. like one of the things that I often say to the guys who come and see me for like early ejaculation issues is um, you know, a lot of them just want this, the the tools to last longer. And I'll say to them, okay, I, I mean, I can do that with you. I can give you the breathing exercises, the squeezing exercises, the energy circulation practices and all that. But if the sex that you're having is not great, right? It's not that pleasurable. 
then having not great, not very pleasurable sex for 30 seconds and not great, not really pleasurable sex for 30 minutes is not going to make much of a difference to yeah. like the experience, right? I mean, if you're having <laughs> yeah. shit sex for 30 seconds or 30 minutes, it's not going to change much. So like the approach to sex is very often the the underlying strategy, let's say, that I'll take with a lot of my male clients, which is like rather than being performance oriented and and having this kind of like, you know, win lose approach to sex, which is like if sex includes erection and penetration and orgasm and lasts a certain amount of time and and you know by extension of that like I'm a, I'm I'm my dick's this big and like I can you know compare myself to these other guys and I like have you know I'm better than them at this like that performance oriented kind of like sport analogy right com- mm-hmm. com- competition approach is um it can you know it can lead to like sex is either successful or sex is a failure depending on whether these things are included right mm-hmm. and that's not a great approach to sex because for example, we mentioned before, like as you age, your body changes, you might not be able to do the things that you did when you were you know, younger. And so if you're still on that, you know, mentality of, oh, if sex has, you know, for me to win at sex or for sex to be successful has to include these things and your body just isn't capable of those things anymore, then sex is going to be a fail each time. And that's going to like really, you know, create a, a, a pretty negative story for both you and your partner. Yeah. So rather than thinking of sex as a sport where you can either potentially win or lose at it, depending on like, quote unquote, how you, how you perform. I like to think of sex as a jam session between musicians. Right? <laughs> and, and this isn't my analogy, but I unfortunately can't credit who I got this from, but this idea of, you know, showing up to a jam session and just playing music with the person or the people that are there in the room with you. You're not recording anything. This is, you're not making an album. You're just playing some music. You're having fun, which is what, you know, a jam session is about. And the key to jam sessions is a few things here, right? Is you firstly got to know your instrument. If you show up to a jam session with a guitar and you've never played a guitar before, you're not going to be able to contribute much, right? You've got to be pretty knowledgeable about your own instrument, right? Which is why I'm an advocate for, like doing some introspective work and unpacking your stories and your narratives and you know, psychologically doing doing that work, but also self pleasure, like exploring your own body, like what it is that turns you on, what type of stimulation do you enjoy, what type of stimulation is too much for you, right? That sort of thing. Um, so really getting to know your own instrument, like playing your 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 instrument, and it also helps to know about your partner's instrument as well, right? Or the other people in that space that you're having a jam session with the other musos. There is, you know, if you're showing up to a jam session. And you've been planning on playing, you know, alongside someone who has a piano and they show up with a, you know, an oboe, <laughs> you're going to be like, oh, yeah. fuck, I don't really know what to do in this situation. <laughs> and, and you might be like, well, I'm, I'm confident and yeah. comfortable enough to go, I can learn on the job right now. You know, I can, and mm-hmm. I can learn in this session and I, I'm, I'm here to, to calibrate and, and to, to listen and learn from you, right? How do I play alongside mm-hmm. you in this you know, jam session? Like that's the approach that I, I kind of think is important to have. Um, and, but the same thing goes for like, like the type of music, you know, this is another extension of this analogy. Yeah. If you're just like really into rock music, right. And you show up to a jam session with someone who's like really into reggae, yeah. right. Or really into jazz or really into classical. It's like, oh, okay. We can jam out a little bit, but maybe that person's just, you know, oh, it was fun while it kind of lasted, but I don't think we're actually, we're not the right fit for one another. Yes. Right. We, we play, we're playing different yeah. songs, right. Playing different music. Mm-hmm. And um and, and but you might be also really curious and want to play music with someone who's like into, uh, you know, Celtic, uh, you know, Irish dance music, right? It's like I would love to learn how to play alongside someone like that. You know, maybe you you have that open mindedness and that curiosity to play alongside people that that have different instruments and different music mm. tastes and things like that. So that's like the the type of approach that I try to instill in my male clients is just like open minded, curious, um, you know, fun pleasure oriented approach right you play music for the pleasure of it you're not trying to record anything or trying to produce an album you're there because it's enjoyable to do because you like music right and so um so that's that's the the shift in mentality that for my clients particularly is very helpful for them to start to let go of whether their cocks erect or not within like the first three seconds of a sexual Mm -hmm. experience and very often just by virtue of them being relaxed enjoying Mm -hmm. themselves playing music you know quote unquote they start to you know be in their parasympathetic nervous system they start to focus on the pleasure of it that allows the body and the mind to sync up and their erection comes back right or the guys that are coming too quickly usually that's because they're quite tense and stressed and and worried about coming quickly right but if they're 
letting go of that and just focusing on like, God, is this, is this fun? Is this enjoyable? Is this pleasurable? Maybe I'm not so focused on my cock anymore. Maybe I'm focused on other things that are enjoyable for the two of us. Maybe it's toys or fingers or hands or you know, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just there enjoying the experience. They're relaxed because mm-hmm. they're relaxed. They're, they're not so on edge and so tense and so tight, which is things that lead to a quicker ejaculation. And so they're able to last a little bit longer. And then on top of that change in mentality, we add in the practices, right? Mm-hmm. Like the squeezing, the breathing, the energy circulation, the yeah. specific tools that are going to then to be helpful to extend that really beautiful, playful, pleasure-oriented sexual experience in the first place. So that's yeah. a long-winded way of saying that's my approach, yeah. but um, yeah. that really specifically works for the guys that I work with. Like if a guy's got diabetes and he has to take Viagra for that, you know, yeah. Then I'm I, I can work with him, but it's going to be um, taking into consideration mm-hmm. that like he does have this underlying medical condition, or if he's mm-hmm. got you know um, it's, it's like a nervous system condition, like I've got to take into consideration that. So I can work with those types of guys, but it it it's um still follows a similar similar kind of through line, but it, there's considerations that mm-hmm. it, like there's some physical stuff going on for that person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I absolutely love that analogy of the jam session, and it kind of shows how intricate intimacy and sex really is and how much variability and variables come into play. Um, and yeah, I think one of the things that I always find interesting as well, when, when talking about like lasting longer in duration, and I don't, I don't know too many women that are like wanting to have marathon sex sessions, like when the sex is like medium, (laughs) Or mediocre, yeah. you know, like no one wants to have like okay sex for 45 minutes. They're usually like, okay, like that isn't necessarily the primary marker of good sex. I would, I personally would say. Um, so kind of releasing that tie between like, oh, the time and the quality, um, as well, I think is a kind of a helpful reframe, perhaps, to take. Um totally. as well. In yeah. There. And, yeah. And I think like even disentangling that sex doesn't have to look like thrusting your penis inside of a vagina for 45 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Like sex incorporates so many other activities, Mm -hmm. but when people, I mean, again, projection for me here, like I used to think this is like, if I want to have longer sex, what that mean, what that meant for me was I want to be thrusting inside of my partner for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Right. And sure that can be pleasurable, but what I wasn't taking into consideration and what I do try and take into consideration when I work with my clients now is like, you know, focusing on oral sex or using, mm-hmm. you know, your fingers or even like sexy massage or using toys or even like the, the conversations and the anticipation, the excitement mm-hmm. that you're, you know, leading up to any type of touch is still part of the sex. Right. And so in terms of like longer sex, that's what I try and paint a picture for my clients. It's like, you can do all these other things that extends the duration of the quote unquote sex, because it's a much more holistic and broader definition of the term sex rather than intercourse, which is what a lot of people think sex is, right? Which is just mm-hmm. penis in vagina and, and mm-hmm. thrusting away. Um, but like, like pounding away, like a piston in a car for 45 minutes is actually not that pleasurable. <laughs> uh, for, for I mean for 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 both men and women and whoever else is involved like just like in and out thrusting for 45 minutes I mean sure it, it can be fun but it, there's not yeah like there's not a lot going on you know yeah. what I mean <laughs> so um so yeah that's so I, yeah. I I appreciate you saying that because disentangling what what it means to quote unquote mm-hmm. last long day is also helpful yeah yeah and I'm thinking let's say if someone's listening a guy's listening to this and they're hearing the opportunities or the shifts that could possibly be made because I think in some ways there's like a lot of beauty in the way that men are action oriented and goal directed and like that is like a beautiful part of of what we could consider masculinity and so kind of having the option to release some of that might be challenging so what would you say to someone that might be having those thoughts yeah. So the way that I kind of leveraged that, um, you know, action oriented mentality that a lot of guys have is, and, and, you know, what I will say as well is like a lot of, a lot of guys that I work with, and this is true, this has been true for me and, and guys that I speak with in general as well is, how do I say this? Like a lot of guys won't necessarily do 
something specifically for them in the bedroom, but they'll do it because they think it's what their partner is going to enjoy more of. So mm-hmm. like I've, I've kind of said before, and I've, I've not necessarily gotten in trouble, but I've had some backlash. So I'll try and explain this. It's like a lot of guys will prioritize their partner's pleasure over their own. Mm-hmm. Now I'll stop there. Cause I, I know that people are like, well, what about the orgasm gap? What about, you know, the, the, the fact mm-hmm. that like a lot of women actually aren't experiencing a lot of pleasure during sex. And so the, the caveat I'll have here is like, there's a difference between sexual gratification and sexual pleasure. Gratification for me is just like that quick little, you know, sticky white crotch knees, scratching the itch, just kind of like jerking off, ejaculating, you know, wipe your hands, get on with the rest of the day. That's just like the gratification is like scratching the itch. Pleasure is that like deeply um, sensual, erotic connection with another person, connection with yourself, full body experience of like eroticism, right? It's like a much more... um, much more in like the the word that comes to mind is it's immense as opposed to just like scratching of the, the surface level itch um so that's the difference between between pleasure and and gratification in my mind mm-hmm. and there's also a difference between like authentic pleasure and genuine pleasure and what men perceive their partner's pleasure to be right and mm-hmm. so a lot of guys within that framework of prioritizing their partner's pleasure over their own is a lot of guys also prioritize their own sexual gratification over pleasure. And usually the pleasure that they think that their partner is experiencing is just like their perceived pleasure. It's not actually genuinely authentic pleasure for their partner. That's one of the reasons why a lot of women will fake orgasms, right? Is is there's, you know, because a lot of a lot of guys focus on their partner's pleasure. A lot of women feel that pressure to look like they're enjoying themselves. And so they will, they will fake it or they'll at least you know elaborate it um um rather than it being like really genuine and authentic you know, a lot of guys aren't asking you know their partner you know whether they're actually enjoying themselves the guys are like really focused on orgasm and so like they uh, that that again the goal oriented right like they're they're tr- like they're trying to get to penetration trying to get to orgasm trying to get something from sex have like achieve it um, be successful with it and it's successful if he makes her come right? but it's not mm-hmm. his like um, I'll say this as well. It's like not your responsibility to give your partner an orgasm. It's their orgasm, right? Like they're responsible for it. Just as you're responsible for your orgasm. It's not your partner's responsibility to give you an orgasm. It's your orgasm. You're responsible for it. You can be there to help facilitate each other's experience of orgasm, but you don't give orgasms to someone like you give them a Christmas present, right? It's <laughs> theirs and they're the one that's they're the one that's having it. So yeah. the um so the the approach is like you know communicating, talking to one another, like mm-hmm. playing with one another so that you can both get what it is that you both need. Um, but like a lot of guys, again, it's it's gratification oriented for them. And to to kind of drive this point home, I've been in a lot of like men's spaces where there has been conversation around sex, but the conversation around sex is like very surface level and very gratification oriented. So what I mean by this is like, we just talked about like, you know, like how well, like I'll, I'll speak on, on my behalf, like how well I fucked her, right? Like how many orgasms I gave her, how much of a you know God's gift to women I am. There's a lot of machismo and bravado, like mm-hmm. in those like really locker room style, you know, male spaces. Uh, you know, I, I, a phrase that I have said and I've heard said is like, yeah, I busted the biggest nut, you know, like it was just focused yeah. on, you know, gratification. Mm-hmm. And, and so like, and, and hopefully this lands for the guys that are listening. If you were to speak about pleasure rather than gratification in those spaces, mm-hmm. like, yeah, like I, I, like it was so like, in, like I felt this in my body. Like I felt it like up in my, my chest. It was like really in, intense and enjoyable. And like, I felt this like deep connection with her. Like if you started to speak like that, and I know this because I have started to speak like that in some of those male spaces. Like you get laughed at, you get bullied, you get ostracized, mm-hmm. you get told, bro, what are you fucking gay, bro? Like, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the pejorative, right. Uh, of using the term gay and that, that more like, what are you a pussy man? Like, you know, the, the language there is very denigrating and very, um, you know, dismissing of pleasure, right. It's, it's focused on the performance of gratification. So, um, you know, and a lot of guys will talk about like how much they, how many orgasms they gave to their partner, you know, how much she was, you know, enjoying it and things like mm-hmm. that, really like over exaggerating for the most part. Right. And again, it's the perceived pleasure. Like she was having such a good time and I was just fucking it. Right. Like it's yeah. the prioritization yeah. or the, the pedestalizing of her perceived pleasure, not her actual genuine authentic pleasure. Um, and again, it's focused on his gratification. Yeah. So that's the, that's the expansion of like that, that simple little phrase there. And like I said, I've, 
gotten into trouble for like not doing that before and just like mm. saying that men think about women's pleasure more than their own but there's a few caveats in there and a bit more yeah. nuance um so in a roundabout way what i'm saying is like <laughs> what one of the things that i'll do is like a lot of guys have that mentality and it's almost like quite noble it's like i want to do this because you know i want to last longer to give my partner more pleasure right mm-hmm. i want to have better erections because of my, my partner like i want to ha- i want to fuck my partner for a longer period of time or whatever it is right mm-hmm. so like the the goal oriented or action oriented thing that, that's in their mind is like i'm do- i have to do this for my partner right i've got to do my do better sex to my partner is like their you know base kind of goal and it's like all right that's great man um it's noble you want to you know you care about your partner mm-hmm. right that that's that's awesome um so i'll leverage that and be like great let's let's talk about how to have better sex for your partner let's talk about how to give her more pleasure right mm-hmm. and so that's where um i'll just like leverage that same mentality of like i'm, I'm doing this for them and um i'll say you know if you want to give her more pleasure you have to be able to experience more pleasure mm-hmm. right the the depth of pleasure that you can take her to is dependent on how deep you can go with your own experience of pleasure right mm-hmm. so um if you're trying to hold that for her, you've got to be able to hold it for yourself. So that lends itself to like, oh, okay, I've got to be a bit more connected to my own body. Oh, I've yeah. got to actually notice where I experience pleasure. Oh, maybe that leads to a self-pleasure practice, right? Um, maybe that leads to focusing on on things sexually with my partner that don't maybe involve ejaculation, right? So one of the mm-hmm. things that I'll, I'll typically share with couples and people that you know work with me is like, have sex that doesn't involve an ejaculation. I have sex that doesn't involve penetration, right? Really start to, to disentangle the stories and the narratives we have around like what sex has to look like in order for it to be successful, right? Because ejaculation and penetration are very much part of that performance-oriented approach to sex. Like they have to be included for sex to even count as sex, let alone, you know, successful sex for sex to be a win. So if we start to take those things mindfully away, okay, what else is there? What else is left on the table if we take those things off the table? Um, so you know, it's... it's Again, it's like action oriented. It's like, all right, we're going to take that away. And then I might give guys like a practice through um, like a pleasure mapping practice, for example. And they can do that both solo and with a partner. It's just like treating it as a bit of an experiment, you know, mm-hmm. and touching if you're doing it with another person, like, you know, explore your partner's body from the tips of their toes to the crown of their head by using the tools that you have on the end of your arms, right? These hands that we have <laughs> can do. Okay, they can do a lot, right? They can pinch and scratch and pull and slap and rub and press and caress and do all these other like amazing types of stimulation. So like explore mm. your partner's body. Um, again, starting at the toes and going to the crown of the head over the course of like, you know, minimum 20 minutes, I'll say like, mm. if you can set aside an hour to like do this. And like I said, treat it as experiment, collect data about their experience. You know, like there's no, there's no, it's, there's no success or failure in an experiment, right? Mm-hmm. You, you're collecting information, collecting data. So if you do this with your partner, like really start to touch them in novel and unique ways across their body and you find out, well, they really enjoy it when, you know, and if you're asking for that feedback, like tell me when you really enjoy something, give me a rating out of 10 or say yes or no or whatever. Like, oh, they really enjoy it when I like caress just under their breast on their rib cage, right? Like, well, that, that they're saying that that's really enjoyable for them or, well, they really don't like it when I kind of squeeze their thighs, you know, firmly. Like that's not enjo- like they're saying that. Oh, okay, that's that's information mm-hmm. that I can now take on board as a lover, as a partner, and incorporate into like a more sexually explicit, you know, scenario with them. Like, oh, yeah. maybe I'll incorporate some of that light, gentle caressing on their rib cage, or maybe I won't. Maybe I had been squeezing them on the thighs when I was, you know. Um, you know, having sex with them. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm, I won't do that so much anymore because mm-hmm. I know that it's not really something they enjoy um, and vice versa, right? You can, you can have your partner do that to you to help you learn more about your body. And so that they can collect that data and information about your experience. And then mm-hmm. you've got stuff then to communicate about and incorporate into quote unquote sex, right? In that holistic sense of the word. Um, yeah. So like that's, that's like an action oriented thing you can do is like collect that information, collect that data. Um, and again, taking into consideration that, you can only go as deep with your partner's pleasure as you can go with your own. So like giving mm-hmm. yourself that permission to really start to go deep with your own experience of pleasure to help you hold that space for your partner, both like physically and, and energetically. So yeah, I don't know. There's a few things there. I suppose I went on a bit of another tangent. Um, it seems to be a bit of a theme so far, but uh, but there's, there's some things, right, that you can start to start to explore. And, yeah. Um, yeah, like, like simple stuff that I'll just give guys. Like if you watch porn every time you masturbate, Try experimenting with not watching porn. You must have paid. 
Now, if you sit down, whenever you masturbate, try standing up when you mm -hmm. masturbate. Mm -hmm. You know, like give yourself the permission to experiment and collect information. That's yeah. that's the approach that I take, right? There's no right or wrong way. It's you collecting data about your sexual experiences and your partner's body, right? So um, if you always have sex with the lights off, you know, invite your partner to have sex with the lights on. <laughs> yeah, if you always have sex in bed, lying down, try sitting, you know, like give yourself mm -hmm. the permission to experiment and notice things. And if it's, and if you like learn, cause it's all well and good to be like, yeah, that was great, right? I learned something, I really enjoy that. That's quite easy. It's like, whoa, this new kind of thing that's cool and interesting and like erotic and I, I like it. That can be an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. But if you do something and you're like, oh, I didn't really enjoy that. Oh, that actually felt a bit weird or it felt a bit gross. So like, I don't really want to do that again. That can be harder, right? Because a lot of the time we have that performance mindset of like, oh, this was a, this was success because I learned something that I like. Mm -hmm. This was a failure because I learned something that I didn't like. Mm -hmm. But in fact, both in the framework of an experiment are successful, right? Because you've learned something new about yeah. yourself. Yeah. Right? I learned I didn't like that. Awesome. Don't do that again, right? Mm -hmm. You learn that you don't like that. Cool. Let's keep on exploring and find some stuff that you do like or that your partner does like. Right. Either yeah. way, you learning something and and like stoking that curiosity is the quote unquote success there, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I don't know. A few more. Yeah, thoughts. yeah, and I I love the reframe of thinking about it as an experiment because there isn't like a win or a lose necessarily in an experiment and and coming and I think it's more playful and exploratory when you come into something when you're collecting data and doing an experiment and you're just trying to figure out what's going on and as opposed to having to like reach a certain goal or endpoint. Um I love that. And and it also shows how going back to the very beginning, this isn't all simple and that every person is so different and unique and that every moment and even as you were saying earlier with even testosterone, like the cycling and the shifts that are happening for individuals, there's always things that are changing and that we can look at that in a challenging way, or we can look at that in an optimistic, exciting way of never getting bored, never being stagnant, <laughs> knowing what to expect. Um, but well, I would love to ask where everyone can find you if they want to learn more about you. I know we didn't even touch on some of the other topics we were going to cover today. I know you even <laughs> had sex toys ready for us and everything. <laughs> so we'll um, have to have everyone connect with you so they can learn more. Yeah. Uh, so you can find me on social media. I'm the Cam Fraser on social media on, on all platforms. Uh, you can find me at my website, which is cam dash Fraser. Um, I've got a podcast as well called men, sex and pleasure, which is these types of conversations essentially. Um, yeah. And, and I talk, like about sex toys for people with a penis and you know how to use them with a partner and a bunch of other stuff around masculinity and sexuality so my um my i guess like my little tagline is if you jump onto my social media you will learn something new love it <laughs> okay <laughs> well cam thank you so much for being here and uh appreciate you coming on the show no worries thank you so much for having me Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of The Naked Connection. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss another episode. Trust me on this, your sex life and that special someone in your life will thank you for it. And if you really love the show, please take a moment and leave a five-star review or a written review and let me know what you think. It would mean so much to me and this show. Until next time, happy connecting.